Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's IOP Speaker Series event, New Faces of Labor, from the Hollywood Writers Room to Staten Island and Amazon Warehouses. My name is Connor Lee. I'm a senior in the college majoring in political science and minoring in English and creative writing. I currently serve as the co-chair of IOP's Student Advisory Board. As a proud grandson of members of the Chicago Teachers Union, it is my great honor to introduce our panelists for tonight, each of whom embody and epitomize what it means to be an advocate and leader in the American workforce. They stand up and speak out against powerful organizations when workers' rights are not respected and are steadfast in their mission to secure better conditions and compensation. James Seamus is an award-winning screenwriter, producer, professor, and director. He's the co-founder and former CEO of Focus Features and has produced Academy Award-winning films such as Brokeback Mountain and Sense and Sensibility. He currently serves as a negotiating committee member for the Writers Guild of America, which just recently ratified its new contract after one of the longest labor disputes in Hollywood history. Shep Searle is a Chicago-based Starbucks worker and union leader. Shep has been a dedicated leader on the picket line, advocating for better safety measures and more robust protections for Starbucks employees, including higher wages, health insurance, and medical leave. Bob Ryder is the president of the Chicago Federation of Labor. Bob has worked as a labor attorney, organizer, negotiator, and lobbyist. As the current president of the Chicago Federation of Labor, he serves on executive and advisory boards across the city of Chicago through which he works to protect the fundamental rights of all workers. Moderating tonight's event is Anna Galland, a nationally recognized progressive organizer with two decades of experience advancing democracy and social justice in the United States. Anna, who we were lucky to have as an IOP Pritzker Fellow in 2022, currently serves as a senior democracy fellow for Propel, an investment and philanthropy venture. A few final notes of housekeeping before we begin. Please silence your cell phones now, and questions will be taken at the end. A microphone will be placed in the audience, uh, so when it's time for Q&A, please line up behind the microphone and uh, ask your question. As usual, first priority will be given to students. Finally, the speaker series has several events coming up that you can attend. On Monday, October 16th at 12 p.m., IOP founder David Axelrod will be, will be in conversation with Congressman Pete Aguilar in a live taping of the Axe Files at International House. Lunch will be served. On Wednesday, November 1st, David Axelrod will chat with The Atlantic's McKay Coppins about his new book, Romney, A Reckoning. That will take place at 12 p.m. at the IOP, and lunch will be served. Now please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our guests, James Seamus, Shep Searle, Bob Ryder, and Anna Galland. So thank you so much for that wonderful um, contexting and introduction. Thanks to the IOP. You are so lucky here at the University of Chicago to have the dedicated team of Zenot and Jennifer and Joel and all the students who are doing such a great job of fostering these kinds of conversations. Um, thanks for having us. And I was so glad for my time here and glad to be back with some formidable fellow thinkers and activists. Um, as we were sort of thinking ahead to today's conversation, Many of us heard observers and activists alike refer to this past summer as a hot labor summer, but it seems to me that that's doing a disservice to the extent and the intensity of the momentum that labor organizers and the labor movement broadly have had in recent times. Perhaps we're in something more like a hot labor reality, new forever labor hotness, I don't know. Um, we're in something new and important and different and I don't think temporary. Um, so when you look across what's happened at UPS and other logistic workers, the auto workers strikes, the healthcare workers in California, New Jersey and el elsewhere, retail workers at places like REI and Trader Joe's and Apple stores, the Amazon uh, logistics workers and plant workers, creative workers, Really, you can't look at this country's economy and find an industry or a sector where there's not something interesting happening by people standing up to advance their own dignity uh, and the conditions of their work. Um, we have firsts uh, like the Amazon facility, which was successfully unionized in a total first for that giant. Um, 
you have new fronts. We'll hear here from James, who played a leading role in putting AI on the table in the negotiations that the WGA had with their Hollywood studios. Um, you have a kind of new militancy with thousands of people stepping out. My understanding is that this year now marks the greatest number of workers simultaneously striking since 2018, which in turn is kind of a new peak that we're seeing versus the last few decades. You have these incredible wins. Um, UPS's contract represents some 340,000 workers around the country. That's the private, in the private sector, that's the biggest single contract, as I understand it. Um, and they had incredible gains for wages and working conditions in that recently won contract over the summer. And then finally, kind of in the background of all this, you see public opinion changing about what unions are, how we feel about them. Um, there's something big happening, is what I mean to say, in sector after sector, in workplace after workplace, and in the kind of hearts and minds of the public in America. I think you're seeing something important. Um, so how do we get here? Uh, and what do we know about who's powering it? Because history doesn't change by some kind of abstract, just it happened that way. Individuals courageously stand up, organize together, and push the ball forward. So who's pushing it forward? Um, we'll talk, uh, we'll get into that. So I wanna actually start by asking each of our um, panelists here to introduce yourself again, just briefly, and talk about what you've been fighting for and what is something you have won recently. Some of these are obvious, and uh, some of them might be more broad-based about the conditions that we're working in. Would you like to start? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, my name is Shepard Searle. Uh, I work at a Starbucks up in Edgewater, uh, right here in Chicago, so I know the city pretty well. Um, I have been with Starbucks Workers United officially since May 25th of uh, 2022. We were the first unionized location in the city of Chicago. Um, and I believe we were 109th in the nation and we are now over 350 strong. So you have seen um, probably in the news, Starbucks unionizing everywhere. We have um, over 10,000 workers. We have um, a lot of wins and a lot of losses. Um, unfortunately, most of what you probably have seen in this movement is seeing that Starbucks is repeatedly breaking more labor laws than any company ever in the history of the United States and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so it has been for us a struggle right now. Our goal is just to see a contract. We have not even gotten to the floor and proposed our initial contract. We have it, it's written. Uh, Workers United has helped us write um, an amazing contract and uh, centralize it for each place. So Chicago, we have Chicago specific needs within our contract. Um, and we got to our very first bargaining session and Starbucks walked out uh, and they didn't walk back in. And that was the only session of bargaining that we've been to so far uh, across the nation. We have seen that repeatedly. So our goal right now is to get that contract, uh, get that negotiation started and hopefully win a contract. But luckily we are seeing many victories right now. Um, the NLRB has recently ruled uh, a ruling that will come in massive favor for Starbucks Workers United specifically. Um, and it demands that when stores unionize, um, they meet us at the table. And it demands that if there has been union busting interference um, in the case, uh, so specifically for the case of the Chicago Roastery, there have been massive attempts at union busting um, and attempts to quell this movement that is so big. And the new um, National La Labor Relations Board Act will see to it that if a store lost its election due to union busting, um, they have to ratify the union contract and they have to meet them at the table. So mm -hmm. that's a huge victory for us and hopefully it will help us see at least the start of negotiating a contract within the next few months. That's wonderful. I want to come back to what union busting actually looks like and concretely how you countered it when we come back around. Absolutely. Um, would love to hear a little bit of this historic win that you've been part of. What did you win recently? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm James um, uh, and I spent really the last nine months as a member of the negotiating committee for the Writers Guild of America. I'm part of Writers Guild of America East. There are two guilds, there's East and West, but we work very well together now. Um, it's great to be in Chicago. There's a real connection to 
the Hollywood union story that starts in Chicago mm. with people like Al Capone and Willie Beoff and the Chicago mob, <laughs> who are, are kind of forebears in the labor movement, so to speak, <laughs> in Hollywood. Easy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what a win. Yeah, all right. uh, so one win was, it was a longer win, which was a win to, um, uh, which, which really started with some pretty major losses back in the 30s and 40s. Uh, when the studios got together and formed these scab and company unions uh, with the help of the Chicago mob. And um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very colorful story. I mean, the, the be off, these guys actually had the, the, the bosses uh, from the studios get on a train once a year and hand over $50,000 in cash. He specified it had to be in a paper bag. Um, <laughs> so uh, so we've had, a, we had a, a weirdly a long and bloody history uh, in Hollywood with the mafia. Uh, and a lot of that filtered through uh, um, folks like Ronald Reagan, who was our president before he was everybody else's at the Screen Actors Guild, um, working with people like Lou Wasserman, another Chicago mob beneficiary, and Sidney Korshak. Uh, that, so, so it's a really wild story, but it's one that has resulted over time uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a culture of struggle mm. and a culture of consciousness. Um, uh, for those of you who've ever tuned into the Academy Awards, uh, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences was actually started uh, by Louis Mayer as a, as a company union hmm. um, to, f to fend off uh, uh, unionization. So yeah, so I'm a little punch drunk because just uh, two days ago, the Writers Guild, um, with one of the largest votes in, the, uh, in terms of percentage of membership in the history of the labor movement in Hollywood, hmm. ratified our contract uh, with a 99% yes vote. So that felt really good Woo. to us because we didn't really know. We got 11,500 very cranky writers. Um, uh, who love to, you know, poke at stuff. What did we win? Uh, we didn't get everything we wanted, but we won everything um, on, on, on every front. And there were a lot of, this is probably the most complicated negotiation, uh, I think, I, I can think since 1960 in Hollywood when mm. we first won uh, residuals and we've won health, pension, and welfare uh, benefits. The working conditions, which are so central to the culture of creativity, uh, and uh, at least some share of prosperity in Hollywood are very complicated when you deal with creative mm -hmm. uh, 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 work. And so there's a broad array of issues. Uh, one in particular that was really important for us was uh, AI. Mm -hmm. And that one took, that was the first thing that the, um, that the studios at the negotiating table back in March, uh, after hearing our proposal, uh, replied uh, silently, but still very loudly to us. I mean, the subtitle was, fuck you. We're not talking about it, and there'll be no counter whatsoever. And AI was the last issue that was resolved wow. the day after the studios announced that they had given their last, best, final, maybe, yeah, kind of best, yeah, for sure, offer. Um, and so we really, we, we watched that AI, take the discourse around AI take shape over the course of that nine months of, of preparation and negotiation. It's not clear that the language in our contract is dispositive to deal with all of the threats to human society and the imminent mm. extinction that we face as a species from AI, at least according to some folks. But it is clear that by reframing the discourse around AI as not simply one which says, oh, AI is going to come to replace us, which by the way, you know, that's a legitimate fear, uh, but rather understanding AI as one front in the battle between labor and capital mm. and understanding that it's not necessarily the thing that replaces you and your work. It's the thing that conditions everything that these large conglomerates uh, now conceive of themselves as, which is, of course, data valence, management, control, mm. surveillance of, uh, and, 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 and absolute uh, uh, mechanistic uh, extraction of value from everything that comes in their way. And by using that frame, I think we actually achieved quite a bit. Something not just for your own workers represented by the contract, but for society more broadly, which seems yeah. like something that you could say fairly labor has done time and again, yes, not just exactly. represent and win things for its own workers, but for society more broadly. You hope. You hope. That's the work. Um, well, so maybe, Bob, you can weigh in to um, tell perhaps a more positive story of the influence of Chicago labor um, on society and our, our shared morality uh, as, a, as a country. Um, no, but really, what I want to ask you as someone who is not here representing one single um, recent campaign or effort, but more broadly, as the leader of the Chicago Federation of Labor, you are... Um, an institution that supports a range of different struggles and unions in their efforts to secure a contract, um, build a union, secure a contract, and then negotiate over the terms of those contracts. Um, I would just love to hear you speak a little bit about something that you would um, 
want us to pay attention to that has been one, either specifically or a broader dynamic, something that has been secured over time through the efforts of you and your team? Well, my team involves everybody that we represent. So mm -hmm. we represent 300 unions that represent half a million people. Mm -hmm. Airline pilots, zookeepers is the fun thing that I say, you know, when I'm doing my introduction or giving a speech. Um, I also make mention that Chicago is the hometown of the American labor movement, and that's important um, for a number of reasons. One thing I want to, on AI, <laughs> but coming yeah. back just for, let me take a pause for a second. Yeah, great. The one thing, because AI is in Hollywood, it's also in journalism and in a lot of other areas, one thing that AI has not figured out is the longer the piece goes, it lacks rhythm, spirit, and nuance. And, and it, that's not just like a catchphrase, and this is something we all have to pay attention to. Like, it's fun to mess around with, people tell me with chat GP, but it doesn't actually, I was talking to some artists earlier today that trick it all the time to see if they can sabotage it. But it's always gonna lack that human element if we, uh, and, if, and it, only, it, only re, it only replaces us if we allow it. Now. <laughs> we get, let's come back. Let's do a deeper dive on AI in the conversation because I yeah. feel like you just pulled out a couple good threads. But keep, what's yeah. some, what, how, how have you laid the table for our sort of shared prosperity with your work? Um, so, what should we be paying attention to? So I get, you know, I am the, I am the quote unquote leader, but I'm, I see myself more as an organizer. And going back, if I look at the way the labor movement in Chicago has organized itself over time and specifically over the last uh, 13 years, you see something significant. So Chicago has always been a place for activism, even as we go up and down through the cycles of what that activism looks like and the way we we as a society have dealt with capital and economics. But I'm gonna I'm gonna work backwards. Last 10, 13 years. So uh, this year we have the almost strike at UPS, and we have very large UPS. Uh, unions uh, here in Chicago, Teamsters 705 and 710. We have, um, we represent uh, Writers Guild members and SAG-AFTRA members here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We have a significant TV and film uh, production slate here in, uh, in, in Chicago. You go back, you go back, you know, over the course of time. I've, I've seen in the last few years uh, a strike by the t uh, Chicago Teachers Union in 20, uh, 2019. Unite Here, the hotel and hospitality workers uh, struck in, the, um, uh, in their industry in 2018. The Mechanics Union, who represents automobile mechanics. Uh, you know, some of you who live in the Chicago area and the suburbs of the city may have seen Scabby the Rat, which was founded here. Scabby was created here in Chicago. <laughs> Two unions fight over which one created Scabby, but <laughs> we know the one thing we all settle on is it's a, it's it was a Chicago. Here. It was it's a Chicago thing. All right, we'll claim that. Um, but then you go you go back. You know, you, there was the Chicago Teachers Union strike in 2012. But even two years before that, the operating engineers, uh, Local 150, and the laborers union uh, shut down all construction work on the expressway for two weeks back in 2010. We have a thread of activism that's built up. Mm. What I think has happened, what I think has happened is people all over the country have been building on the spirit that we have here. Now, I know like the Chicago teachers have been representative of that in the Red for Ed movement and, um, you know, they have stoked a lot of inspiration for young activists all over the country. But if you pay close enough attention to where we've been on the arc of workers' rights over the course of the last 10, 13 years, it's been, it's been on the rise. Mm. Hot labor summer, mm -hmm. that's this year. Right. Last year, it was Striketober, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Strike, uh, I, I, I can't remember how we said it for, uh, Strike Vember, <laughs> Strike Sember, right? We've fought for in this city a lot of uh, workers' rights in front of the Chicago City Council that have then gone to Springfield and now are coming back for us to re-up them 
here in the city so we can always stay ahead of the state. And that goes back to when we um, started raising the minimum wage, but also provided earned sick leave benefits uh, for workers in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So it, th it didn't start this year. I feel like people think that this is a post pandemic thing, right. but it's something that's been building over the course of the last decade. And it, you know, and if you want to look at one, one like spark that happened to get people to pay attention that, to where the economy was and how people felt they were being treated by the economy, I would look to um, Occupy Wall Street, mm -hmm. which came mm -hmm. not too long after the Writers Guild was on strike in 2007. So wait, let's keep going with that thread for a minute, because I wanted to get to asking about what are the drivers, so not just of this hot labor summer, but of this hot new labor perpetuate, perpetuity. <laughs> um, what else, I, as you kind of offered, lots of people have pointed to the pandemic as a radicalizing force for labor, um, but you're also saying, look, it's much older than that. It traces back to Occupy. I'd love your perspective, Shep, on what you see from within the Starbucks context and more generally as the youngest member of our panel. Um, what do you think is driving hot labor life? Um, I mean, definitely, obviously, the labor movement goes back all the way to, you know, Haymarket Square, which is right here in Chicago, which is amazing. And so there's hundreds of years of history under our belt. And Workers United, which is our union, um, started with the garment workers all the way back in 1912, which is incredible because that was also one of the first women-driven unions. Um, but this kind of modern movement, I do obviously, like, I have respected the teachers union um, my whole life, right? My mother was a teacher. I was very familiar with the teachers union. I was out there um, back in, what was it, 2018? So tw 2019. 2019. Was, yeah, it was the okay. last one. Yeah, so I was, I was there with them, you know, on the picket lines in 2019. But I do think the pandemic created a kind of new, unique view of labor, not because of the pandemic itself, mm. but because of social media. Mm. And I think that our movement, um, like, so the Starbucks movement, the Amazon movement, the Trader Joe's movement, the, you know, all of the voodoo donuts, all of the kind of service workers, Collectivo Coffee, like I could keep going. Um, this movement has a unique frame because it's kind of the first era in labor that is driven by a lot of people who are proficient in social media. And being a younger person in the labor movement, I often joke that I am a technology gremlin. Like you put a computer in front of me and it'll break. But it's amazing the work that the people in my movement are doing. Mm. We're seeing videos getting, you know, 20 million views on TikTok. Mm. And there's this information superhighway happening right now that creates this kind of lasting labor movement because people can see it. Mm. Everybody has access to it. And that's something previously where, you know, when the teachers would go on strike or something, you might hear about it in Chicago but you wouldn't hear about it in New York, you wouldn't hear about it in Canada. Right. And now, you know, someone goes on strike in Seattle and I see a TikTok of it here in Chicago that has two million likes. Mm. And so it's this kind of unique, I think more lasting movement, not only because of the pandemic kind of waking a lot of people up in some regards and, and this mm. economic unique situation that we're in, mm -hmm. but also because this younger generation has this flow of news and information mm. that, you can't avoid, you can't dodge it. You know, you go on Twitter or X, you go on TikTok, you go it's on- It's still Twitter. It's yeah. still Twitter. It's still Twitter. It's Twitter. Twitter. You go on Truth. It's Twitter to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you go on any social media site and you'll see news, mm. whether you want to or not. And I think that's waking up a lot of people in my generation and younger. And I see so many, you know, Gen Zers and even alpha generation they're crazy. They're, they're great. I, I don't, I see some of the things they're doing. Um, you know, my movement, for example, like we did a parade like with, with puppets. Um, and there's this kind of new, unique thing happening in labor where the younger generations really are stepping up. It's not just the older folks who care about it anymore. And I think that that we'll keep it going and you know unfortunately we've been fighting for this for over a hundred years but also it shows this isn't going anywhere and now that we have the means to keep it alive through things like social media through things like more active picket lines it's going to keep it will continue happening until 
eventually, you know, it turns one way or the other. So yeah. I do, I, I think social media is more to factor. thank than COVID, but because of COVID, everybody was inside for a long time just ingesting information. They were just looking at it every day and that's all we were doing. And I know for me, that was a huge thing yeah. um, because we saw like, oh my gosh, we won't stand for this anymore. Yeah, um, I appreciate in a way that as you were talking, I was thinking it's COVID had uh, both COVID and the sort of social media bath everyone was swimming in were both push and pull factors. Like there was actually a lot of fear. I'm sure you were hearing this from your workers in various contexts about the health conditions of going to work in the midst of COVID, in the midst of a raging pandemic. But then there was also a kind of pull from the attraction of so much rapid dissemination of inspiration from watching other people stand up and fight. That's, I'm really appreciating that. Did you, I'm curious if you saw. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I can't speak as a, a expert, you know, a sociologist or labor historian, uh, but from my perch yeah. as one of the new faces of labor, um, uh, having, We're gonna talk served, about that more. having yeah. served on the negotiating committee of the Writers Guild 20 years ago, exactly in 2003, oh, wow. uh, for a time, uh, and that negotiating committee was essentially a minion, right? Uh, it was like I was like the youngest Jewish guy, but it was basically us, you know. Yeah, and a lot of Alta Cockers, <laughs> they were amazing people, and it's so inspirational. I, they, and I made such friends for life. Walter Bernstein, one of the greatest screenwriters who ever lived, was also a blacklisty. He wrote a script called The Front about his experience and a great wow. memoir about it, a real radical uh, visionary. <laughs> um, so these were great people. This NEGCOM was completely different and beautiful because um, there was a spirit that was coming into it hmm. that had, had broken some of the old modalities of the way in which hierarchies, even within the labor movement, um, get reproduced. And so that your generation and all these younger generations and the, 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 the ways and just the simple rituals that are often ridiculed and lampooned and uh, critiqued in the op-ed pages of the New York Times and elsewhere of uh, sharing space and all the language of that, um, we took it very seriously and this negotiating committee really loved each other and we, it was the hierarchies, you know, usually you get kind of the guys like me who've had certain measure of success and could bring authority in, um, but we, we had an enormous cohort of people who actually held the room and I think uh, who were coming up, who were, you know, uh, not making rent, losing their health insurance and mm -hmm. fighting this fight with us. And we made sure that those people were at the front of our negotiating strategy rather than taking it to the rear. Mm. The reason for that, I think, um, and I, I say this with all due respect here in the Church of Axelrod, um, is I think <laughs> that the labor movement has moved decisively through uh, the experience of this new generation away from a subsumption in the Democratic Party and its machines. Um, it's still very much a part of that, and this, the, those are important and deep and uh, uh, um, real relationships and, and power structures that we all have respect for. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Red for Ed and the now lamentedly gone ISO, the, you know, the, the, the real radical revolutionary organizing, uh, DSA, these lateral networks that intersect with party and, and electoral politics in, uh, in, in, in really important ways, but provide a culture, especially for our younger members, uh, and workers of, um, of relating across industries and across cultures uh, in much more diverse ways mm. um, and allowing for, uh, uh, again, modes of relating uh, that lose and shed and challenge the kind of hierarchies that I think had, uh, often ossified the movement before. And I, for me, that was the great learning of this cycle of negotiations that we were able to pick up on that energy uh, and use it and but at the same time being aware like you know uh, in california you had folks like karen bass who's the the, new, the mayor of los angeles and you had gavin newsom the governor uh, of the state kind of you know giving press conferences like i'm here to step in i'm making phone calls and i'm helping and they were i mean you know, whatever but then you also clock like you know gavin newsom just named uh, uh, to re uh, replace temporarily replace diane feinstein uh, a, you know, a labor person. She was really in charge of a really important and powerful union, SEIU, mm -hmm. California, who has spent the last couple of years, I'm sorry, screwing workers, mm -hmm. you know, running Uber's campaign to basically destroy any hope that these workers could actually get a, a foothold in a career and a life outside of this fake structure of being independent contractors. Mm -hmm. And that's still very much part of the Democratic Party as we know it, and we know it here, um, that we have to we have to contend with. We and I, our younger members are very honest about it and very open about it, mm. and uh, and I think that's bracing and important. And I think it's going to have long term implications for the movement and for the Democratic Party and the and the country. 
Bob, I'm, I want to keep this thread going of whether um, as a driver for the sort of successes that labor has had over these past few years and the momentum that it has, the new militancy that we're seeing, or perhaps not new, but the increased militancy, um, whether youth, sort of like the age of some of the key actors in the movement is an important driver from where you said. I'm curious oh, for, what for sure. It's so it, so what Shep said earlier about social media and the way that's landing with people and how that works in in the in the in the where we're at right now, it's worked as an accelerator mm -hmm. and at risk is sounding like an economist. <laughs> the the correction that's happened, right? We we know like the CEO, you know, the ratio from CEO to frontline worker was 50 to one. Now it's like 300 to one, right? Whatever the number is, it's ridiculous, right? Minimum wage is not kept up with inflation. That's why we're working, we're, we've worked to correct it. We closed the gap. You know, we're now working, we're working towards $20, but really the minimum wage should be closer to $25, $30, right? The, um, what I think is significant is I'm, I'm on the tail end of Generation X. Mm -hmm. And Generation X is both the worst of the baby, boomer, baby boomers <laughs> and the best of the millennials, but not quite caught up with Gen Z and Gen Y. So here, it, you know, here's, here's, what I'll, here's what I'll say about it is that, um, we had a long run. The best leaders that we had rise up through the labor movement were activists that were born out of the 1960s, mm. right? And a lot of those people lasted in the labor movement for a long time and got their, felt like they got their asses kicked and became, mm. you know, they, were, they became part of their institutions. They were still good progressive leaders with good values. And they kicked, but, you mean they got their asses kicked in the 1980s by the Reagan era? It, it, because, and, and based on, based on how, you know, again, we had a leader who was a leader of a significant union who in the 1950s turned his own people in to, to the McCarthy Commission, mm -hmm. right? Blacklisted writers and actors and things like that. And, uh, you know, in a way set the stage for the neoliberal revolution of the 1990s that did so well, sarcastically putting up his uh, air quotes. <laughs> air quotes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the, 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 the best of my generation are the ones, are the kids who were left on their alone to listen to Rage Against the Machine and actually pay attention to the lyrics. I'm appreciating these cultural references. I don't yeah. know if think, anyone here is going to yeah. be cracking with you, but I'm, I'm, I'm here for when it. When people say they don't yeah. understand the Rage Against the Machine lyrics, I'm like, have you not been listening for the past 20 yeah. years? Like, what's going on? Like, it's very blatant. Hey, let, 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 me, let me tell you, I was, at a, I was at a Pearl Jam concert, and a guy's like, oh, you're at Pearl Jam? I'm like, yeah, I know what the songs mean. I know you don't, because I see what everything else you post on Facebook. So, um, Also, the Facebook reference may have just dated yes, us uh, even further, but yeah, yeah please you continue. Facebook? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> continue. You have, to, you have to still connect with family. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> but I think, I, think what you're, I think what you're seeing is that you're seeing turnover in, in our ranks, both at the rank and file level right. and at the leadership level, right? There's people who are, there's people who are cut young, not just younger, not just younger leaders. There are people who, um, are further removed from the, the revolution of the 60s hmm. and are fomenting the revolution of the last decade. And the revolution of the last decade hasn't been about, uh, just about fighting, you know, you know, leading anti-war protests. It's been about everything all at once. And social media, as Shep correctly pointed out, whether whether you're an old, you're, you're a crotchety old person on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, right? Reels or threads, you know, <laughs> threads isn't cool enough for anybody yet, but it's, it's created, it's created ways for us to have community in a different way. Mm. 
and for people to be bolder about what they're saying, both good and bad. We, we all can see each other in a way that we didn't see each other before. For me, some people I feel inspired by what I see from them on social media, I also see the things that scare the shit out of me, Yeah. right? Because I, I'm, you're hearing an unfiltered thought from someone who tells you how much progress we haven't made, right? It's, you want the, uh, social media is the great lie detector, right? The, the, the lies we present to each other as we're walking down the street get exposed through social media because people can't control themselves. Can I ask, sort of to pull together these threads about the ways in which social media has changed the um, ability to inspire people from across the country, to spread information quickly. I kind of want to um, understand better from each of your perspectives how the nuts and bolts contract negotiation process, or even prior to that, the process of getting people together to get a union off the ground in a work site where you're up against a very hostile um, boss, and then the process of working through very tough contract negotiations, that's a, sort of a different modality than spreading the word about exciting strikes and protests and union activity. So what's my question here, I think, is I'd love to hear from Chef's perspective. When there was kind of a rubber hits the road moment of, all right, we're going to make or break a union in this shop right now, um, how did that work and feel? And you mentioned earlier some union busting from your bosses. Can you just take us a little bit inside the anatomy of what it felt like inside your shop when you went through those steps? And then I'd love to hear whether you, um, and, then, and then I want to back out to the bigger picture as well. Um, yes, yeah, so obviously I am a in-store organizer. I was, um, back in 2020, early pandemic, I got a dog. And <laughs> this story is important because I got a dog Relatable. who was siblings with my coworker's dog. So we, got, we brought the puppies home. And my coworker and I were like, okay, let's have like a social, a safe social distance puppy play date. So he came over um, and this was back in like August, 2020. And we made a joke about how Starbucks was gonna fail. And we, we, it was a joke, it was a half joke cause you know, we kind of knew. And we made this joke about like, well, we could always try to unionize. But oh, so that- This was prior to any sort was, of union activity. This was prior yeah. to the Buffalo, came first. this was, um, it was kind of one of those, like, in Starbucks, we were told. We, we had to watch these videos when we got hired that were basically like, if you hear about union activity, report it to your manager. <laughs> and it was, familiar. yeah, it was rigorous. Mm -hmm. And it was, we, like, the idea of trying to unionize was so taboo that if you so much as mentioned it, if you so much as said the word union, you were on, like, high alert, you were on a fire watch list. Um, and so it was kind of like this thing where we had a feeling that capitalism was about to make a giant turn hmm. because the pandemic meant essentially we are losing billions of dollars by paying our workers while they're not at work or by paying essential workers more. And then we quickly went from this, we're essential, right? Like Starbucks workers, we were told, you know, we're feeding the first responders, we're essential workers. And then two months later, it was, well, you're just making coffee again. And um, hmm. I am a supervisor, was a supervisor at the time, and we saw it happen. We saw this thing we were joking about happen. And then we saw Buffalo, New York, Starbucks organizers became the first Starbucks union ever. And immediately we said, okay, then we're doing this. Um, and it was scary because the threat of getting fired, the threat of our store getting closed down, these malicious tactics being used against us were very real. And when you're a Starbucks organizer, these are not just empty threats. Um, I have seen friends of mine get fired. I have seen um, a location get closed down here in Chicago because they unionized. I have seen um, Starbucks holding these meetings where they asked us how we were voting. They were directly breaking labor laws and not even trying to hide it because they had enough money to throw at the problem to where they could just keep breaking the law. And it's terrifying, but it also is motivating mm -hmm. because it says if they're doing this much to try and stop us, that must mean we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. 
And it kind of came from like, and, and once again, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? Like we had Chicago Teachers Union, Chicago Federation of Labor showing up to our little strikes, our little picket lines. Hmm. And so when we started this, when, when we, you know, like you said, put the rubber to the, to the street, um, it was like this kind of terrifying but invigorating feeling. And, you know, once we saw one store, mm. one Starbucks unionize, we saw 350. It was so fast. Within wow. two years, there, there have been so many stores and this momentum just keeps going. Like there's one or two new wins every single day. And it was scary. And I think we had to do a lot of clandestine bar meetings. We went to Fritzy's Tavern in Edgewater, Chicago. <laughs> um, and we discussed, or, or Parsons Chicken and Fish was the other one. I love Parsons. Um, and we went to these stores and we started talking about it. And then suddenly it was real. And suddenly we were in it. And I think there hasn't been a moment of this campaign where I haven't thought, how am I here? Um, because it's, it's truly terrifying because any moment the retaliation could get us. Yeah. But any moment we could also have a massive win. You could also win. And yeah. social media, once again, has a huge hand in that because it's, it's one of the first times we're seeing visibly people talking about what is happening. And, and we're seeing, you know, when Starbucks breaks the law and the uh, National Labor Relations Board says, you broke the law, there's a TikTok about it. There's a talking fish on my TikTok timeline telling me about how <laughs> Starbucks is breaking the law. And somehow that talking fish is more accurate than a lot of news sources. Is the talking fish something we should all know about? Oh, it's a, that, it's, a, okay. it's a very, I, I mean, if you're on TikTok, you might know of it. It's the talking fish from SpongeBob SquarePants who reports uh, Got news. Got it. It's very fascinating. <laughs> I, I, I get a lot of, I, I'm ashamed to say I get a lot of my news that way, but <laughs> you know, it's the Gen Z way, I guess. Okay. Um, um, well, Dan so, Rather doesn't really do his thing anymore, so you're cool. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> see, yeah. <laughs> you have to get it from somewhere. Um, gotta, yeah. Yeah, we gotta get our news somewhere. Um, and so, you know, when we're seeing online them saying Starbucks broke the law and they are getting charged for that, it changes it for a store, you know, somewhere smaller like Nebraska who doesn't have access to the resources we have in Chicago with, right. a, with a union town seeing that we're, we are winning in little ways. And even though it feels like loss after loss after loss, there's also so many wins. And so it's a scary thing to, to do it, but knowing us doing it is, is motivating someone else to do it. And then there's that chain reaction has been really cool and, and life-changing. Yeah, can, can I, can I yeah. just say something too about this, which I think is, it, it reflects on something that Chef said earlier is that one of the things that we were missing from the from the deindustrialization of the United States that happened in the started in the 70s, 80s, and then got finished off pretty much in the 90s was that those jobs were replaced by jobs in the service industry. Yeah. And there's traditional places in the service industry where workers had representation. Mm. And but as this economy sort of blew up, and you know we went from getting coffee at the White Hen Pantry here in Chicago or 7-Eleven or the gas station, and people started, you know, um, getting more involved with this with their coffee, which by the way is like a response to wanting to have something that you feel good about, and mm. you know. You know, feel like you're treating yourself, and what it doesn't matter what level you see yourself in the strata. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be at the same level, but people view, you know, regardless of what your economy is, this is like something that people can all access equally at some level. We see that, um, and, and a ton of money then went into this niche industry. We went from being able to, you know, stop at a White Hen pantry, go in and pour our own coffee, to now getting like, this really fancy drink or cool drink through a drive-thru. Handcrafted, handcrafted beverage. Handcrafted <laughs> beverage, yeah. Spoken um, like a true Luddite. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's sort of, it's sort of, you know, we now see like service workers have this, have this class identity mm -hmm. that sort of formed over this period of time that I was talking about. But again, it got accelerated by social media. The pandemic played played a role because we're so much more 
pressure on service workers mm -hmm. right during the pandemic because it became all about like how do i how do i still engage in the creature habits of my life that existed before mm. right you know i'm not going to lie to you i i i now which i never thought i would do is i'm ordering my coffee on my way to pick it up right like i go into i don't want to ask you what you're ordering but we'll save that for afterwards. yeah yeah it involves oat milk Okay. So, <laughs> Mine too. Yeah. But it's not a chai latte. I just no, 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 no. I drink coffee. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't understand the powdered stuff. So, um, I I think what one thing that the Starbucks workers union did specifically, um, along with Amazon workers, but I think that the Starbucks workers even more so, has made this opportunity to organize accessible to a broader group of people, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like the economic fervor was there, the rebellion against how, how like um, concentrated our capital was in one, in one group of people mm -hmm. revealed itself and then has also inspired every, everyone else to continue that fight and has made it bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Started in Buffalo, obviously it was gonna take you know, take hold here and um, has inspired people here, right? right. You look at what collect, um, Collectivo and in, Intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. um, and La know. Colombe. Yep. And they, I mean, Intelligentsia, they, they've got, they're the first ones to actually uh, get their union and then get to a collective bargaining agreement because, uh -huh. you know, and it's a much, it's a much different dynamic yeah. because it's a much more concentrated, it's only a few stores. Um, the 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 audacious the audacious dream is to take take Starbucks and hold them accountable just like we would Amazon because Amazon is the modern industrial employer. The Once client. you get yeah. outside of the automakers and AT and T, which are two of the biggest em union employers in the world, mm. Amazon is what replaced line manufacturing in the United States that mm. went overseas. And we should say here, and I didn't say this explicitly at the top, we're very sad to not have uh, Michelle Nieves here, who was uh, unable at the um, late in the game to be with us um, from the Amazon Workers Union, but there have been these incredible organizing efforts aimed at cracking the nut of this, um, this question of whether Amazon can be unionized. Um, can I actually pull on that for just our final question before we're going to turn to um, taking questions from our audience here? Um, but the, the title of our panel today was um, is new faces of labor. Um, we did end up with a, an all white panel, which is not reflective of the current face of labor, to be clear. Um, I, but I think back to my own history books from middle school and high school, and I had a sort of, um, in my memory, stories of the labor movement have a certain profile. They're often men doing heavy, burly work, um, you know, miners in West Virginia or auto workers in Michigan, and they're inspiring stories, the struggles that those folks um, went through laid the groundwork for much of the modern labor movement. And to be clear, even back then, the labor movement was much more diverse than the few stories that I might have internalized. Um, but we are seeing, I think, in a way that you just spoke to, Bob, the kind of emergence of a class consciousness and of a kind of sense of an identity as workers with a whole different set of conditions. People who work in domestic work, people who work in service industry, people who are creative um, workers. And I just wonder whether we can close this section before we turn to um, uh, our, our audience questions with briefly from each of you, one person that you want to, that you think of, that is a worker that you have represented or organized with, um, that you think of as someone who, you just wanna bring them into our conversation, someone that inspires you in the organizing work that you do. Um, yeah, for me, um, uh, my friend, Allison, uh, she is a single mother of three children. And I'm gonna cry because she is the epitome of a working class mother. And before unionizing, she was getting relentlessly just screwed over. Um, and she would come to our boss every single day and she would say, I need more hours to feed my children. Like she's on, you know, uh, food stamps and stuff like that. And she is a good friend of mine. And then once we unionized, she got on board so aggressively and, and, and heavily, even though she's, you know, 
raising three teenagers. She is trying to keep herself afloat. She is working as many hours a week as she possibly can as Starbucks is continuing to cut her hours and, and try and make her quit or whatever. And she's going through school so that she can have her education. And all the while she has this fire and she is not afraid to stand up ever. To, she's not afraid to stand up to her manager. She's not afraid to stand up to her district manager. And she is the first person at the picket line every single time. She brings her children. She got to accept an award on behalf of Workers United at a um, banquet recently. And she brought her children there with her. Wonderful. Um, and she is just, to me, the face of like why I do this, mm -hmm. right? And when I think of like why I'm doing this, I think of my coworkers. Um, and I think of all of the people like her mm -hmm. and all of the people like um, all of my coworkers who are sitting there just trying to make a living. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have shot back with, oh, well, you're just making coffee. You don't deserve a union. That's for hard workers working with dangerous machinery. And I was like, well, first of all, we are workers working with dangerous mm -hmm. machinery. Yeah. Uh, I have had multiple instances of people having to go to the hospital because of working at Starbucks, um, but also everybody deserves a union. Mm. Everybody in the workforce deserves their voices heard. Um, people like Allison um, and people like me. And I think that that is why I continue to do this, is that reminder yeah. that everybody deserves this representation. Thank you. James, who's someone you think of? Oh, just briefly, I, you know, I, I, I go back to 1984 as a graduate student at Berkeley when we first tried to organize graduate student teaching assistants and couldn't find really many takers in the traditional labor movement to kind of help us out, but some, eventually they did. And then this past year, I, my, my actual day job, I'm a professor at Columbia, and I was able to kind of be part of the cheering section uh, for my students, my graduate students, who mm -hmm. successfully organized uh, the teaching and research assistants uh, at Columbia. That was a bitter strike. The university pulled out the, the old guy, Bernie from Proskauer Rose. Some of you may know that firm. Um, you know, the great union busters, and they pulled, they did every dirty trick they could, and my students won, and it was a great mm. victory, and it was really inspiring for me. Wonderful, thank you. Bob? Yeah, so, when I think about this, you know, I have a lot of experiences from my own union when I worked uh, organizing um, different groups, but the one, the, the ones that have the biggest impact on me, and I'm, it's not gonna be one person, but it's gonna be um, the the workers who um, went on strike in it with the with unite here the hotel workers union yeah um, and it was specifically the the workers at Marriott because I I spent time with them during their bargaining in the last 24 hours I I showed back up to you know um, I was asked if I could come in and talk to the workers as they were as they were in like a evening bargaining and uh, I ended up staying the whole night with them and looking at the room attend watching the dynamic between the room attendants uh, the doorman and the um, and the bartenders it was fascinating and you know the room attendants are the ones that have um, who are at m who are the most vulnerable mm. in that in in that situation and watching the door, the door folks and the bartenders stand up, specifically the bartenders. We're talking about bartenders at some of the, you know, properties that cycle through a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, uh, tips and mm. a lot of a lot of capital gets transferred there. Mm. Um, looking at them holding the line mm. for the room attendants who are facing quote unquote green programs, which were really just about cutting their cutting staff and cutting hours for room attendants who were, you know, these people work at fancy downtown hotels, but they live in a variety of neighborhoods on the south and west side, mostly women, mostly people of color. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't, you know, I, I've, I stood with them in so many different contexts over the years that I, I now have all these relationships that exist at rallies, on social media, like these are these are people that not only once once we once we met in that time and spent all that time together, mm. you know, all the friend requests started coming in, <laughs> and uh, I accepted every single one of them because these are these are the people that we represent and that we fight for. It's not 
we're not we're not in the we're not in the business of the labor movement. The labor movement is an institution. We're unique in that we're an institution that is lifted up by a movement that is bigger than just mm. the uh, structural organizations. And we have to always think of ourselves as both an institution and as a movement. Thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate that you brought us to a landing on solidarity between the workers in that context and then the importance of solidarity with the broader community as well as the implication I'm immediately thinking of. Um, all right, so we're going to open it up now to questions from our audience. Um, I believe if you want to be bringing a question, there's a microphone um, in the center aisle. Um, preference goes to the students, um, true to the spirit of the Institute of Politics, which is here primarily to serve the educational mission of this university. And we have our first question. Thanks for. Great. Hello, my name is Matthew. Um, I'm a fourth year undergraduate, undergraduate student at UChicago. Um, I just wanted to ask you something because you talked a lot about labor unions and how it used to be considered something very taboo um, and just about the strength of the unions and what they can do. And I thought that it was really uh, inspiring, uh, really uplifting, but I also saw recently a video that got leaked from Amazon, which was essentially a way to crush unions as soon as possible. Mm. Um, I don't know if you saw it, but basically it was like a demo video that said like, oh, for example, um, if people start congregating after work more often, or if people start acting differently, if people start um, you know, talking about livable wages or any sort of buzzwords related to unions, that they will be disciplined right away or that they will be moved as a way of trying to weaken unions before they can even be formed. Mm. So I bring this all up because I wonder um, what do you think are some ways to allow unions to form and survive even under pressures like this? That's a great well, question. I, I wish we had somebody from the Amazon union here. I've oh. had the uh, you know, privilege of, of um, being on panels with, with some of those organizers, and they are, you know, like Unite Here, I mean, the real heroes and you guys. I mean, it's just, it's, it, and, and at, a, at a level that's almost inexplicable <coughs> to articulate unless you really talk to somebody who's lived what it's like to try to organize in an Amazon warehouse. Precisely, we talked about artificial intelligence and predictive mm -hmm. AI in particular is being mobilized by, uh, by companies like Amazon so that they're tracking you know, worker movements, right? They track you in the warehouse and they're tracking where you're, you know, bath not just bathroom breaks, but also speed of delivery, finding stuff. And they, they are tracking congregations of workers. They'll find out if two workers have been talking by the water cooler for 40 seconds, 80 seconds, et cetera. Mm. So, you know, these folks, I can't speak on their behalf, but they're smart. And um, they're trying to figure out ways to jam that system. Uh, and, um, and, and they've, they've had their losses too, as we know. I mean, there was a big, uh, you know, they've, they've had, had some losses. But, um, you know, every time you, they come up with this stuff, Workers are constantly finding workarounds uh, and more and more, but I don't have a big global thing, but I just want to share, like, because I was, I was so happy to be sharing space with this uh, a woman from uh, Amazon who was talking exactly about this stuff and how they're dealing with it. I imagine that the public also has a role to play. I don't know, Bob, would yeah. love to hear you speak to any aspect of it. So the law has been broken since 1948 when the Taft-Hartley Act was written. And the Taft-Hartley Act took rights that they created for employers and superimposed it on a workers' rights statute, which was the National Labor Relations Act of 1936, which was passed to, to facilitate the public policy, bipartisan act, the policy of the country with the passage of the National Labor Relations Act was to facilitate collective bargaining because it was, it was a freight train coming down the road because they did as many things as they could to fight back the unionization of, of the United States for the 50 years prior to that, and they sort of gave up. And once they had everything corralled, the, the enemy <laughs> got together and they superimposed. It even looks clumsy the way it was written, like structure-wise. Um, so we now, we, we know that this, what Amazon's doing to those workers, those those videos, the captive audience speeches that, uh, that Starbucks has, we've been dealing with that for a long time. With the energy that we have around um, organizing 
And I got to be honest with you, with like what they're doing to jam the system, it's fun yeah. because every big, every big, every small organizing campaign is an act of rebellion, hmm. a rebellion against an unfair system. And I see that, I think part of it is like, we've had enough, but then when people start acting through that act of rebellion, which is rooted in justice, it's fun and worth it, <laughs> right? So what are we doing to combat it? We can't say all those things right now because we're live streaming. <laughs> yes. Um, but, but we create our own rules. Oh yeah, I, I was gonna say, I will say, um, there's a quote that I love. Um, it's from Hosier, he's a musician. Um, and it says, the jackboot only jumps down on people standing up. And it is one of my favorite quotes because it says, if these corporations are making these videos that are saying like, we're gonna stop you if you try to unionize, that's just gonna motivate us more because that means they're scared and that means they know that all of us together in solidarity are more powerful than they will ever be. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of those things where it's like when they retaliate, we just have to keep going because it's the same thing as anything. You know, you see people succeeding and you will realize that you can succeed too. And this movement is not possible without people. It's not possible without solidarity. And so we, we just do, we just keep going. And I know that at Starbucks, same things happen that are happening at Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris and we Smalls, just go. Chris Smalls organized outside the plant like you guys do with Starbucks. Chris Smalls is like the coolest person in the world. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a lot of hanging out after, after work and, you know, doing it at a bar if we have to and keeping our mouth shut until the next action, mm -hmm. you know, so. Mm -hmm. I, awesome. I really appreciate that you brought up that um, even outside of like factories, like a lot of jobs at Starbucks and Amazon can still be, you know, very dangerous and how you brought up a lot of the, you know, very real concerns there. So mm -hmm. yeah. really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your question. I appreciate you. Thank you. Let's see if we can get our next person. Hi, uh, my name is Dahlia. I'm a second year here at the college. Um, I just want to say I also love Hosier. Um, anyway. Thank you, me too. Uh, yeah, hit home. Same. But um, this, you have to believe me, pains me so much to say, but President Joe Biden has, gets a lot of like praise for his like title of like the most labor friendly president we've ever had. Um, and that's like maybe true in some ways. Like we, he just went to Michigan. Um, for like the UAW strike, um, but last year with like the real workers strike, like he really screwed the pooch on that one in my opinion. Um, and like nonetheless, like he gets that praise all of the time, but like you guys mentioned, like there is kind of like a divergence um, from like an association directly with like one party um, or either of the two parties um, when it comes to like labor work. So I guess I was wondering like what you guys think uh, the role of like genuinely elected politicians within like the standard two-party system of the United States is when it comes to uh, these kind of like labor movements, like what you would like to see, maybe even like people you think, maybe not Joe Biden, who are like actually doing like some really good work um, on behalf of workers. Uh, because I don't know, I don't really think it's him. Yeah, I, mean, I, can, I know we're going to be running out of time. There's so many questions, so I'll try to be brief. But uh, you'll be surprised. Uh, I share some of the, as you can imagine, some of the same critique. But you look at the NLRB right now, compared to what it was a couple years ago, and I have to say, yeah. you know what? Hats off. Um, so it's really, you know, I, I think the main thing is that uh, what the labor union is doing is, is, is what it should be doing, which is showing its power and trying to keep fear in the eyes of elected officials who often have uh, a, <laughs> many other obligations to other parties who are writing checks. <laughs> and so I, I, I think that, it's, um, that the alliance between the Democratic Party and labor is an important one, but the subsumption of labor under 
the terms of that alliance are shifting, and I think I'm very excited about it. And I know we have very little time, but... Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, and just very quick, I think ultimately workers' rights is a bipartisan issue. And I say that, and people, like, they get scared because, you know, a lot of the people that Workers in, uh, United interact with are not Starbucks workers. They're Levi's workers in a small factory in Kentucky, and they're voting for Trump, right? Because they don't know any different. And so I think that when we see politicians actively stepping up, it is important because they need to see who is really supporting them. Um, and in reality, I mean, Biden is, you know, once again, I, I share criticisms, but there are also politicians. I had the privilege of being on the phone with Bernie Sanders, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, and he gave us a personal shout out. Um, and I know AOC uh, is also doing a lot of important work. Ilhan Omar, I had the privilege of meeting and talking to. Um, so there are, you know, when politicians do get involved, I think there is an essential element of that. And like you said, like there is value and, and importance in the relationship that the Democratic Party has with labor. Um, but ultimately, I hope to see more politicians stepping up and, and recognizing that workers' rights is bipartisan. Workers' rights is something that everybody needs. And I think that Hopefully, we will start to see that transition more and more. So, Just very briefly from Bob. Yeah. One more question. So, um, our our movement should not be tied to a political party. Our movement can be aligned with political parties. Um, in terms of President Biden, um, what James said is right. I've lived through a lot of different, you know, from being from from my young activist days to 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 now we do have the best National Labor Relations Board, a broken labor act, mm. but we have the best. And whether, um, whether a politician gets it right every single time, I care about what the politician does. And uh, Joe Biden, for someone working in the labor movement, is not gonna be remembered by whether he showed up at a picket line for the UAW. It's gonna be about the decisions he made and the people he put into place. I mean, we had a former union leader running the Department of Labor who now has moved on to run another large union, right? So, and Julie Su, who's now the new director of the Department of Labor, is, is a, an amazing person yeah. who's pursued aggressive policies on the behalf of workers and immigrants. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, it, you know, the, 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 rail, the, the rail strike aside, um, this is, you know, judged by their actions and I don't care what party you're from I'm you know I I I'm a dem you know I'm, I was going to describe myself as a democratic anarchist but then someone's going to clip that but <laughs> <laughs> but it really what it what it what it should be is whether our values align and whether they support us I don't care if they're a democrat or republican and I'm a I'm a I'm a self-avowed progressive so you know Awesome. So we, we have, we're so close to closing. Um, and so I think what I'm going to ask is for our final question to keep it very, very brief. And then we're going to have a quick lightning round of responses and then we'll close our event. Please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anand. I'm a first year MPP from Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, I had a question about the Hollywood striker, uh, Hollywood writer strike. Uh, India also has its own very uh, powerful and dominant uh, film industry. Yeah. And it also has its own labor unions, but they are tied up to the political parties. And if you understand the division of labor in Indian film industry, it's also associated with highly skewedly related to the caste system, mm -hmm. where the lower caste people are still doing the manual jobs with no security, uh, uh, killing, getting killed, getting uh, handicapped in the job. And then there is a, a hugely skewed relation between who owns the fruits of that creative process. So I want to ask you that um, how in such situations you can negotiate with the forces of power who are there in terms of film studios who hold the broader economical um, control over this whole economics. Mm -hmm. And what sort of advice that you will give to the people who want to unionize and mobilize uh, creative uh, laborers, creative artists, and people who are working in this industry, including and understanding their racial diversity, their class diversity, caste diversity, and gender and historical realities. Thank you. Yeah, I can, can do that. Can in you speak to that. Twelve in seconds. Yeah, sure. Um, 
I, I can't answer the question. Uh, it's a great question. And I can point, however, to what I think is tremendous incremental uh, uh, gains within the Hollywood creative community, but the broader creative community too. The Writers Guild of America East, for example, has been aggressively organizing in the digital space, and it caused a lot of internal tension. It was not; it has not been easy. Uh, the, the the guilds, you know, they're called guilds. They're not called unions. Kind of fancy, um, <laughs> but it's about this shift between ownership and copyright to work for hire, where you have to really finally admit you're a worker, and that means you're part of a collectivity. And industries like the one I'm in, workers uh, represent within our ranks an enormous variety of class positions. Mm. And I think one of the things that the Guild, Writers Guild has done well is find, is find within, internally within the structures it's built for, as working conditions for all of its workers, even those who are higher up on, the, on, on that so-called ladder, a common cause. That is to say, those from different class positions actually have a vested interest in bringing up those coming in. And uh, through, uh, so we have a very old school kind of mentorship culture. And that it was weirdly, and I'll, I'll just very quickly say, that was oddly something that was not talked a lot about in the press and the coverage of this five month strike. It was a brutal strike. Was that weirdly, a lot of folks said that culture was the thing we really need to preserve almost more than anything. And that means we need to preserve the chance for people from different class positions to find this common cause and help each other bring up those, those, those people coming in. And I think that was a huge win when you look at the actual details, which I will not get into because we're running <laughs> we out of time. But I think that, you know, finding that and I, uh, uh, within uh, union cultures is so important. I want you to, and I will hold you to this, one sentence on something that's giving you hope as we wrap up for the night. Shep first. Um, honestly, just one word, solidarity, like true solidarity I have seen in this modern movement more than in any of the previous ones we see. Beautiful. Love it. Um, oh, one word, Shep. Hey. <laughs> I mean, these guys are doing it. They're killing it. Yeah. Love it. Bob. Workers. Workers. All right. Wonderful. Thank you all. All three of you were so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>